Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, my name's Stuart Moots. I'm the director of the Pro Audio team for Shaw UK. I've got with me Dave Phillips, who's our senior manager, looks after a lot of our Pro Audio accounts. A, a very little brief history of, of, of what we do. So in the Pro team at Shaw, we look after, obviously, the broadcast, live, uh, theatre, sports events, anything where you see a, a wireless and, of course, a wired microphone. Um, so we're going to chat to you a little bit for over the next hour, hour 45 minutes about um, wireless audio and the importance. So uh, please bear with us. This is our first time back in over a year. So uh, we're all, we've been sat down for a year. Yeah, we've been presenting to um, on, online seminars. So we've been presenting sat down to a camera <laughs> for 18 months. And we were really looking forward to being able to march up and down and wave our arms about and point at stuff on the screen. But we've been told we've got to stay in these seats. <laughs> so, But feel free to ask, ask questions as we go along. Yeah. Um, but we'll start with a, a little bit of history from uh, Shaw. So if you can see on the screen there, we've got a, a memo from 1947. And that was from Ben Bauer, who was one of our... Uh, the first engineers, what a very important engineer for, for sure. He, he invented the Unidyne capsule. But that note that I just can't see because it's too far away, um, is basically a, a memo talking about the first idea and use of wireless with, with one of our um, microphones. Yeah, what, what Ben, it's a memo to a guy called H.S. Knowles who was the patent, as the Americans say, patent officer for sure. And what he's basically saying is we're considering the development of a wireless transmitter that would go either in the microphone stand or in the microphone itself. And he wants Mr. Knowles to look into the, the, the patent situation for a device like that, but also look at the FCC regulations with regard to spectrum and how, what the law might be in regard to using such a wireless device. So back all the way back in 1947, before wireless microphones even existed, the FCC consideration and spectrum consideration was already a, a, an important part of bringing that product to the market, you know. So fast forward to 1953. Um, All the way forward, yeah. And that's, that was the first wireless mic um, that Shaw produced. That was called the Vagabond. Um, if you can see on that picture there, she's actually, there's actually valves in that handheld. So, um, it had an operating range of uh, 700 foot, um, battery life of up to 30 hours. So uh, even, <laughs> even back then, impressive. quite impressive from where we are. Yeah. Um, a little bit more information on there, and I know that's probably a little difficult to read, but even in there we are talking about there is no uh, license required. So even back then in 53, we were talking about the license requirements for um, wireless systems. So th this system, it, it ran in the two megahertz part of spectrum, uh, and it, it worked on the principle of a loop antenna. So it's not, not quite induction loop as we know it today, but, but it, it, looks as it was a wireless system rather than induction. But, it, but the transmitter operated within that loop area. Uh, it was quite expensive, $700 back in 1957. It was a lot of money. Uh, and it found its way onto some of the big productions in Las Vegas and actually some of the big uh, houses of worship venues adopted this system. You could run two channels of it. There was a body pack and a handheld uh, unit. So that was uh, pretty much the first commercially av available wireless microphone system that ever came to the market. So yeah, so that was then and sort of you move into where we are today with wireless. Um, We'll just throw in a few, few examples of obviously where we'd expect to see, see wireless, um, but the use case is obviously exponential. It's going through the roof in terms of how much wireless is being used, and we'll get onto why it's important. We need to sort of understand what else is going on in that RF environment. So again, the example we've got here, the TV example, this is, I always want to say yeah, it's Britain's factor, got, it's Britain's but it's got Britain's talent. Got talent. Yeah. Um, but we, we do a lot of the, we, we involve with the, some of the coordination and a lot of the, the setup for this. I think X Factor in its previous guys prior to what happened last year was up to 162 channels of wireless yeah. across the board. Um, so you can obviously see those channel counts are, are going up somewhat. And then, then as we sort of move on into different areas, we obviously know we've got film production as you know, we're here today at the Kit Plus show. Um, studio broadcast again. The, the, the studios that we've got, ITV, all the new studios running a lot of wireless as well. 
and again, field production. So just, just many, many use cases in, in broadcast of, what, of where wireless appears. But we've also got to sit alongside um, things like broadcast performance. So here we've got Emily Sande that was from, from the Olympics. So it was a London broadcast. She's using Shaw on this um, broadcast. To there was, uh, I think the audience worldwide was something like 90, 90 million people, which was, it actually still holds the record for the biggest live broadcast of an Olympic opening ceremony anyway. Um, and 90 million, but then subsequently, obviously that, that performance has been watched over, over and over again. The challenge with this particularly was that Emily was singing Abide With Me a cappella, so there was no, you know, there was no music to support it, so it was a one microphone, one voice. Um, she is standing with the mic on a stand, so you would think that maybe if you're gonna have a, a fixed position, just use a mic with a cable. Um, but actually that's our Axiom analog product, uh, which is by the Axiom digital product, but that transmitter is, is, is broadcasting on two separate frequencies and the control of the system is able to replace either of those frequencies at any point in the performance without any interruption of the audio if there was to be any interference. So in actual fact, with that wireless transmitter, we had a level of redundancy that you, you wouldn't have had with a, 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 a cable with a microphone, uh, a microphone with a cable. And yeah, al alongside that, obviously we take into account we've got, well, as we can see from here, we've got Old Trafford over there. So wireless used now heavily in the, in the football, in the Premier League with the VAR. That's got to be absolutely rock solid or not, depending on your point of view of the VAR. Um, but again, sporting events, the channel counts just go up and up. They're now, if you, the rugby league as well, you take you know, all, a lot of the players are mic'd up. Although we don't hear the full broadcast feeds, we still hear the ref feeds. So again, just the, the use case of wireless going up and up. And we've got to sit, sit alongside a lot of other uses cases as well. We see here Bruce um, singing, obviously, at one of his concerts. And in, I guess if you ask the average person how many channels of wireless you see on that, you can obviously see he's got his hand held on there. But if you look a bit closer, you can see all the musicians are all wireless. We've got a lot of the backing vocals, a lot of the instrumentalists. So again, these, these channel counts just keep growing and growing. Yeah, uh, uh, award ceremonies. Um, Again, incredibly complex productions, sometimes these things are. Uh, and as you were saying about the last slide, in, in the live performance sector, it's, it, in many respects, the microphone is part of the performance, so it's very visible at the front of the stage. But then when you move into some of these other genres and broadcast and theater and so on and so forth, the, the object of the exercise is to hide the audio. Um, you know, you don't want the audience to know how the sound reinforcement is being achieved. Um, so, you know, it's not always that obvious. Uh, a case in point being, obviously, theater, slightly gratuitous shot of our ADX-1 um, micro pack being hidden in a wig cap, uh, because again, they use all kinds of techniques to hide those systems in, in, in theater land. Yeah, and again, it's just an, another one of those reasons. I mean, it's the reason we're using wired mics today, so you can hear us. We've got the BBC that side, ITV. There might have been something going on, going on at Old Trafford, but we're kind of getting squeezed for space in terms of what wireless actually means. So, you know, we, we're going to talk about what, what spectrum we had prior to 2020, and then obviously we had whatever happened last year. We actually lost a lot of spectrum during the pandemic. Um, so we, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and obviously with all those sort of multiverses, all those use cases going on, we've got a higher potential for interference from other users and, and, and externally as well, from external sources. So we need to work out a way of increasing how we can, be, we can use that spectrum more and how we need to move into to, to digital and how digital is gonna be come to the fore when it comes to wireless. Yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna touch a bit a little bit on some RF fundamentals, not get too deep into the physics. If if anybody is interested in that part of it, we do a, a wireless master class uh, where we get we do a, a much deeper dive into into how the wireless systems really work. Um, but just quickly, we wanted to give you an introduction to radio transmissions. So um, a, a transmitter obviously um, processes the audio signal uh, and transmits it over a, a radio wave. And then the receiver picks up that radio wave, demodulates the audio signal and, and feeds it back into the onward um, audio system. 
Um, the properties of radio waves, it's an electromagnetic wave. Um, it's, um, it's moving at the speed of light. We don't need a, a, a substance to propagate through, like sound you know, requires air or a, a substance of some description. So we travel, we travel at the speed of light, we travel through a vacuum. Um, minimal power in the greater scheme of things to achieve decent range. Um, there are two components, both the, the electrical and the magnetic component. Uh, and generally speaking, um, uh, a radio wave is polarized in the orientation of the transmit antenna. So if you think of a body pack that would normally be mounted vertically or top tip is to mount body packs upside down. And then if it's a particularly energetic performance, any sweat or whatever that runs down the cable will drip off the loop in the cable before it runs into the connector. So that's a top tip. Um, but typically a body pack antenna will be in the vertical plane. And in that case, the optimum position for your receive antenna would be also to be in the vertical plane. But you may have a mix of packs that are positioned in different places. We saw before the, the cap, the wig cap, you know, with the pack that was going on the top of someone's head. So that's typically why you would see uh, receive antenna placed in that V formation. Uh, when you do that and you put that 90 degree angle between the two antenna, you give yourself the best possible chance of being within the sort of polarization orientation of one or the other antenna at any particular point in time. So that's, that's a, again, another good tip. Uh, in terms of wavelength properties, wave, wave science, wave physics, it's, it's the same whether it's waves in water or waves in sound or electromagnetic waves. Um, the, the, the sort of point we want to make here is that, um, you know, we measure in hertz or megahertz, kilohertz. Um, the length of a cycle is, you know, is from the beginning of one cycle of the wave to, to, to the start of the next cycle. Um, lower frequencies have longer wavelengths. It's the same as audio. High frequencies have very short wavelengths. Uh, it's good to have an idea of what those wav wavelengths are because it kind of affects how RF behaves when it meets obstacles. Uh, so. Uh, uh, an RF wave meeting a metal ob object of some, some description, say, you know, a pole or something like that. If the wavelength is bigger than the object, it'll pass around it. If it's smaller, it will be reflected off that metal, metal surface and be reflected back towards the transmitter. If you have a series of metal objects with gaps in between them, and the gaps in between are smaller than the wavelength, then the wavelength would still be blocked as if that was a solid metal surface. Um, so in this particular diagram, you can see that VHF, we've got um, wavelengths that are measured in meters, one and a half meters. Coming up into the UHF spectrum, typically at 600 megahertz, we're about half a meter. So if you get, have an idea of, you know, particularly if you're working in a theater or, a, or something that has some kind of stage structure, you can get an idea of which parts of the structure would block that half meter wave uh, and reflect it back. And then as we come higher up, uh, we get into the, you know, the shorter wavelengths at 2.4 gigs, where we're at about 10 centimeters. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, this is, this uh, again, is probably too small on the screen for the audience here to see, but the, the, the people who are on the stream can probably see it. This is a, an indication of the whole uh, of the spectrum that we use from 300 kilohertz all the way up to 500 gigahertz. Uh, and it gives you an idea of how congested that is, how many things are squeezed into that spectrum. Um, we've got lo long wavelengths at the 300 gig end and then short wavelengths at the 500 gig end. And I think I can only just barely see the, the notes on the laptop, but what, what basically we go into a bit more detail about on the full presentation that we do of this is that long wavelengths tend to have better range, particularly outdoors, for, for not that much transmitter power. The shorter wavelengths come into their own with digital systems because we can pack more data onto short wavelengths. There's a, one of the modulation schemes that we use in digital systems is, is phase modulation, and you can only have one phase change per cycle of the carrier. And obviously, with shorter wavelengths, more cycles, you can send more data, basically. That's the, that's the, the, the very condensed version of that. Um, but let's have a quick look, closer look at the UHF band. Um, there we go. 
Um, so over the last, well, since 2012, since, since the, uh, just after the Olympics, we lost a big chunk of the, t the, the UHF TV band, which was the 800 meg block. Um, and then more recently, last year, as of last May, the next block down has been sectioned off to provide space for mobile, new mobile communications, so 5G. Uh, so although that has been severely reduced, um, it's still the biggest piece of continuous spectrum that is available if you want to build large channel counts for large events. So typically that, the UHF spectrum is still where we would go if we want to build large, large channel counts for festivals or uh, broadcast shows, Olympic opening ceremonies, Super Bowl finals, that kind of thing. Uh, that's, that's typically where we would still, still end up. This is kind of what it looks like. I don't know if you want to... No, yeah, um, yeah. So this is, we've put North London in there. The Shore UK office is, is just north of the M25 in Waltham Abbey. So we use this as, as an example. So, um, so pre-May of last year, um, this is what the, the landscape looked like. So in, in that UHF band that starts down there at sort of channel 31, e each uh, eight, med, make eight meg block is broken up into a, an individual channel. And that goes back to old analog TV days. So I know up in here in Manchester, where, I, where I'm from, Channel 55 used to be BBC. And then when we moved into digital, obviously we multi we multiplexed and added more channels in there. But the green channels there, the interleave spectrum, is where we as, as PMSC users um, can operate. And those purple chunks, I believe they're purple, um, are where the DTV exists in North London. So that's the Crystal Palace transmitter that's transmitting all the DTV out to the... Um, yeah. to the county and on the bottom from where it is from 700 meg all that is blanked out is all that was that was the 800 meg band that was sold off back in 2012 to, to DTV yeah. so that's what it looked like uh, pre 2020 yeah. and then this is what it looks like today so obviously you can we've, we've lost probably half the spectrum that we had there just for selling off that 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 chunk from last year so we've all had to move up, but it's not just us that have moved, it's obviously the DTV that's moved. Um, and I should say that we, we share this UHF spectrum with DTV. I, I mentioned that it, at DTV quite a lot. It's quite useful to, to know where, we, where those spaces are because they're a fixed location, they're at a fixed strength, and we can work in between those spaces. So um, although that looks frustrating, it is quite useful to know that yeah. information, still have that information. So. I just wanted to bring up again a, a, a real-world example. Um, if you go to the, the Ofcom website, pmse.com uh, or .org, uh, there is a tool there that you can put in the postcode of a location, and it will tell you what the occupied DTV channels are, uh, and it will tell you field strength, so what might be usable indoors and what is usable or not usable outdoors. Um, and then the spaces in between are the places that we can buy a license for if we, want to, if we want to license some space in between those TV channels. So on the left-hand side here, we've got the, the TV map, as it were, for this location, this very location where we are today. Um, and as you can see, there were 18 DTV channels that were potentially licensable for PMSE use outdoors. Now, when we were talking about the 700 meg band going away, a lot of people have been lulled into a slightly false sense of security because they might have thought, well, I don't have any 700 meg equipment, so I'm not going to be affected by this. However, if you notice the top section of this left-hand, um, the left-hand side of this slide, um, there wasn't much available for licensing in the 700 meg band. There wasn't much DTV space that, that was available for 700 meg bands. So if you were doing an outside event here before last May, not this May, last May, the May before, you probably wouldn't have looked at 700 meg as a location for your wireless systems because there was nothing available to license. So again, the, the slightly false sense of security would be that I'm, I'm not affected if I'm doing an event in Manchester at, at, Media, at Media City because we never ever could use 700 meg before. So there's no problem. The problem is that all of that unusable space was where the DTV channels were. And they've now been moved. And now they're in the 600 meg band. Well, I say now they've all moved. 
55, which you mentioned, is, is still in the 700 meg band, so they've been given a little bit of extra uh, time to reposition that one. But we've gone from 18 TV channels that were available to be licensed down to nine TV channels, so exactly half of what we had before. But the problem is that the space, the usable space, has moved to a different position. So if you were to turn up here with um, a wireless system that isn't particularly wide tuning that you've used here for maybe a, a recurring event for the last 10 years, you might actually get here and find that there is no spectrum available for that particular piece of equipment. You know, and, and it's not just here, this has happened all, all across the country. So during the time that we've been locked down and people have been on furloughed and now are coming back to work, this repacking of the DTV channels has happened during the last sort of 18 months. So people are going to get back to work and find that actually systems that worked perfectly fine before might not work anymore because there's now a TV channel sat on top of that. In theory, if you had a license, you would have had an email to say, you know, your license is no longer valid or you will have to move to another piece of spectrum. Where do you want to go? Um, but again, because offices have been closed uh, and people have been furloughed, that email might have gone to a, an email address that's not been monitored or it might have gone to an admin or an accounts department or something like that. So it's really important to, to stress that the entire DTV landscape in the UK in the last 18 months has changed no matter where you are. And the system that you've got now, whether you were running it with a license or not, and we know that some people don't bother, um, and we don't encourage that at all, because if you're not licensed, you're not visible. Um, but people might find that, that, that repeating the same setup that they've always had no, is no longer going to yield uh, reliable results. Um, so basically, the upshot of that is we've got you know, a growth in demand for, uh, for wireless spectrum from the likes of the mobile phone companies, um, and the subsequent congestion and, uh, you know, and, and sort of pressure that's put on us as an industry. But as manufacturers, it's put pressure on us to build new systems that are more efficient, that are able to squeeze in more channels, more wireless microphone channels into a smaller amount of spectrum, because essentially that's what we now have to do. We've got less than half of the spectrum that we had even 12 months ago in most locations. Um, and so, yeah, quite simply, the technology is now available. I mean, this, again, during the, the, the fuller seminar that we do, I, I, <laughs> I talk at length about the reasons that we've had to move from an analog wireless system to a digital wireless system. But one of the main benefits is the fact that we can pack at least double the amount of channels into the same space. So that, that's one of the, the primary reasons. Uh, there are some other things which we'll come to in, 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 a, in a moment. Uh, in terms of staying up to date, uh, the Ofcom website, uh, as I said, if you create an account, even if, even if you're not the person that's responsible for managing, maintaining, or buying licenses for your organization, go to pmse.org, create an account, um, it, and then allows you access to these tools, online tools, that allows you to put in a postcode and find out what the TV landscape looks like in that particular location. Uh, Berg is a, a, an industry group that represent us as stakeholders in the negotiations with the government when they decide to sell Spectrum off, so they protect or fight our corner. Uh, Comsreg is the equivalent of Opcom, but it's for Ireland, uh, for anybody that's working over there. And APWPT, which is the Association of Professional Wireless something, I can't remember. Um, it's a European website, uh, and again, they've got some very, very useful resources. They've got a downloadable PDF, which gives you the contacts for all the licensing bodies for France, Germany, Italy, and all of those places. So if, you, if you're doing touring work, for example, you can find out what the regulations and the rules are when you go to those places. And that brings us to uh, um, yeah. the, the Axiom Digital section. So we're going to, I mean, we usually try not to turn this into a sales pitch. It's meant to be RF information. But, you know, we are here as an exhibitor. So we're going to give you a little bit of product information at the same time. Yeah, so, well, I think we're just going to start. With the, yeah, the reason that we're here is we've got our Accident Digital platform. Um, it's been very successful over the past four. Have we lost a year? Let's say four years because we lost a year. Um, in touring and theatre, um, we made huge inroads into theatre. Um, 
And we had to do that purely because we had to move into digital. We couldn't get those channel counts that I spoke earlier on about, you know, in the, the X Factor, the Britain's Got Talents. Those, those channel counts just wouldn't happen with an analog system. So we, we are being forced to go digital. Um, and Accident Digital represents the best at what we do. Um, Shaw's a 96-year-old company. You know, the, the history that we alluded to before, we, we've been doing it for a long time, so we've got a, quite a good handle on, on how to do things. And it's recently, it's, the, it's this year, in fact, that we've, we've moved that Accident Digital platform into a portable receiver. So we've took everything that we've learned from the touring and the theatre world and the, the, the studio broadcast side of things and put this into a portable receiver with the exact same functionality. Um, so yeah, with, alongside having a digital platform, um, we can see in there that you know we've got true digital diversity. The sound quality is actually much, much better than what an analog system would, would, would ever be. There's no companion in those systems. So you're literally, what you're putting in is what you're, you're getting out. Um, a, a lot of, a, another big thing that comes with digital, which has been an added benefit, is we can encrypt. So we can encrypt those transmissions as well. So even you know, previously on an analog system, it would be very easy to, you know, in, in sensitive situations, and we've all seen those on the news where someone's left a mic on and yes, the feed may have been gathered from elsewhere, but it would be possible to have a scanner, a very cheap scanner to, find, to, to get onto those systems and, and discover what's going on. So encryption's been, been a huge added benefit that we've got from going digital. Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I think specifically for broadcast, Encryption has been important for a long time in the corporate world. You know, the Googles, the Facebooks, they don't want people to eavesdrop on their, on their transmissions, on their meetings. So they've been using encrypted wireless for quite a long time. Um, theatres have become in, interested in, in encryption because when they're rehearsing a new theatre production, they want to keep that a, quite a close guarded secret. So they don't want people outside in the street tuning in with a cheap 30 quid. Um, you know, SDR dongle, which you can do with an analog system. Uh, but again, when we're now talking about movie sets and, you know, soap sets and so on and so forth, those storylines are very closely guarded secrets. Um, and newspapers will pay money. So, you know, the days of analog on those kinds of uh, projects is really, really numbered because, as I say, you, ca you can't just, with pretty much any analog system, FM system, you can just use a regular SDR dongle and, and, and tune into those. The, the audio won't be perfect, but you will be able to tune in and, de and demodulate that audio. With the digital system that's encrypted, you can't do that. Um, as Stuart said, we, this system's been around for a while, so we have rack receivers, uh, dual and quad receivers. Um, but I think, again, one of the big advantages is, is, the, is this really, really wide range of transmitters that we've yeah. got, the selection of transmitters. We've got a huge range of those. Yeah, so we've got the, the sort of the standard transmitter is literally your 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 point to point. It, um, you tune it into a frequency, and away you go, and it gives you you know a level of control. We still get all the functionality that we get with encryption. We can still do all that. We've got um, a, a level of remote control on there, but it's when you move on to the sort of the next section, the next level of transmitters, where things really start to sort of take off. The ADX transmitters that run alongside that that portable unit are all fully remote control. So you can control any parameter on those transmitters via the, either the portable receiver or the rack receiver. There's obviously the, the ubiquitous app that we've got to go with it as well, or via the, the workbench software that we provide. So it just provides more peace of mind. There's, there's, there's things in there that we, we won't go into too much now, but we've got interference detection in there as well. So we're, we can change frequencies on the fly if the worst does come to the worst and, you know, someone at Old Trafford does decide to turn a, a transmitter on and, and we get interference, we can move away from that frequency if we've, if we've done a good coordination. Yeah. And then yeah, lastly, it, oh, sorry, go on. No, but I was just going to say, this is, kind, this is the digital version of the system we were talking about that was used at the Olympic opening ceremony where, you know, we, if you want to, you can transmit on two frequencies from one transmitter. Uh, and replace either of those two frequencies, detect interference and replace either of those two frequencies without any interruption in the audio. So it, 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 it can be actually a fully redundant system from the RF to the way the audio is managed. You know, even at the outputs of the receivers, we've got various options there as well. Um, this is kind of the jewel in the crown, the micro pack. Um, it's, uh, we, for anybody that wants to see one of these up close, we have got 
some of this stuff on our little gazebo stand outside. Um, but basically the AGX-1M, it's, it's small, um, it's about this sort of size. Uh, it has no external antenna, um, so it doesn't, you know, when you, if you're again hiding a, a transmitter in a wig cap, it's all well and good to make a very small transmitter, but if it's got, you know, four inches of, of twig antenna sticking out, then that's still difficult to hide. Uh, so it doesn't have an external antenna. The only connector on it um, is the microphone connector, the Limo connector. Uh, it's fully remote controllable. So once it's been installed or, you know, fitted to a, a, the talent or the artist, um, if we need to change a parameter or mute the RF even, or what, you know, change the RF power, and we can do all, do all of that stuff by remote control without having to then, you know, sort of dig in the artist's wig or, you know, wherever it might be hidden. Yeah, I'd just add to that is uh, it's obviously having an internal antenna, it's not a metal casing as well. Mm -hmm. So it's made of a material called Ultim, which um, is very sort of temperature transparent. So if you've had this in a bag or, you know, in a warehouse or it's been in a van, you know, as soon as you put it on the talent, um, it's, it's not, there's not that shock of cold. And again, equally so, it doesn't get hot. Obviously, it's a digital transmitter. There's more power going through, but it's, it's, it's not uncomfortable to wear. Um, and it's designed in that way to be, to be worn on the body. In fact, it, it is designed. Having no external antenna, there is, a, there is another antenna in there which actually senses, you know, the mass that it's worn to and will tune and, and uh, mitigate against any, any sort of dropouts with that. So it is, it is, it's a pack that's designed to be worn on the body in a, in a comfortable way. And then lastly, we, again, we, last year, we introduced the uh, Q5X transmitters. This was more sort of to do with the, the sports and more reality TV, the location sound of things. Um, so Q5, Quantum have been doing analog transmitters for some time. They produce a number of, of transmitters. There's the AquaMic, uh, which is a waterproof transmitter, um, and the Player Mic. So the, the AquaMic is a, a, is a mic that's designed to, to it is a waterproof mic. Um, we've got Limo, single Limo connectors on there. But the guts of those transmitters are all the Axiom digital transmitters. So things from the, the, the micro pack that you saw on the previous slide are found within those packs. And, and the player mic, again, is a flexible uh, transmitter, so designed to be worn on the body. But it's been adopted into uh, a lot of sport, the NBA, again, sort of rugby league, anything where there's a high impact, but you want to hear what the mics are doing. Um, yeah, the Q5X are, are just a good, another good digital solution. Yeah. Um, so, again, another sort of benefit to uh, the digital system is the, the fact that we can pack in very high channel counts um, so we have this high density mode. So even in normal mode, where we're able to do pretty much double the number of channels that the equivalent analog systems were able to do. But then we have this additional high density mode. And what that does is it, we, we turn the power down slightly. Um, but, but that said, um, Axiom Digital at two milliwatts has the same range as UHFR, which was our flagship system, analog system for a long time. Uh, Axiom Digital 2 milliwatts has the same range as UHFR had at 10 milliwatts, so you know it's still it's still very usable range, um, but it allows us to go from 23 channels in an 8 meg TV uh, band. UHFR was 10, 12 channels. Axiom Digital is 23 channels in an 8 meg TV band, but in HD mode we can get up to 63 channels. So we're already getting back to those really high channel counts. You know that, that you know massively. Um, uh, high channel counts for some of those those really really big events just in one TV channel at that point. Um, I think we've kind of already covered the difference between um, yeah. AD and ADX. So the AD transmitters, as, as Stuart said earlier, have all of the qualities and the encryption and, and the range and the HD mode, etc. But they just don't have the remote control functions. The ADX transmitters, uh, you have the show link remote control function. Um, and we get to um, questions from the audience. Anyone Any questions? Any questions? There must be some questions. Yes. Did you mention latency on one of those Yes. What is the comparison of latency from the analog system to the digital system? Yeah. Well, it's not as 
I'll just, it's just, just for those that are listening, because yeah. I don't know if anyone who's streaming can hear that. So the, the, the question was, if I could hear it, was the difference in latency between an analog and a digital system? Yeah, yeah. So it's not as clean cut as you might think it is. A purely analog system, a, a, an old school analog system that has analog, you know, modulation in the transmitter, no DSP processing at all, and analog processing in the receiver has no latency. But it does have a lot of other limitations like compounding um, and pre-emphasis noise reduction. It's a bit like the old Dolby noise reduction where you turn the high frequencies up before you transmit and turn them down at the other end because that reduces, effectively reduces the noise, but the noise is still there. Um, but actually, as analog was developed, most of those outgoing analog systems weren't purely analog. They were still analog in the transmission, but there was some digital processing somewhere in the chain, usually in the receiver end. And so some analog systems actually had as much as 1.6 milliseconds of latency just because of the digital processing in the receiver. The Axiom digital system is, fu is a fully digital system, but it has two, two milliseconds. The official number is two milliseconds. The real number is like 1.97 something. Um, so the reality is we, we did have a, a situation where someone, a guitarist in a famous band, was looking to move from his analog wireless system to a digital system, and he was concerned about the latency. But it actually turned out that the analog system that he had had this DSP processing in it. So he was already accustomed to 1.6 milliseconds, which he hadn't realized was there. And the transition from 1.6 to 2 was barely noticeable. So anything, anything below sort of five milliseconds, if, you, if, we're, if we're looking in a wider audio network, say for example on a Dante network, the target is generally to be below five milliseconds. And the wireless system, if we stay in the digital domain, if we're not converting you know, from digital to analog and back to digital again, which adds additional processing time, but if we're going straight out of the Axiom digital system into Dante, for example, or into the AES outputs, um, then our net latency is, is, is two milliseconds, and we, you know, it stays well, well under that threshold. Yeah. Anybody else? What are the, what are, the um, are there any license-free um, frequencies still available? Are they, are they all going to be licensed now? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so yeah, are there any license-free? Is there any license-free spectrum left, Dave? Uh, yes, there is. So 2.4 gig. We we make and so do other manufacturers make 2.4 gig systems, which live in Wi-Fi world. Uh, and of course, as you know, Wi-Fi is uh, license exempt. It's we, we don't like to use the license-free thing because it suggests there is a license, but it was free, but it's actually exempt from from a license in in the Wi-Fi world. The shared license. Uh, which people commonly refer to as channel 38, the channel 30H is a shared license. That actually costs 75 pounds yeah. a year, I believe it was the last time I looked. Uh, and a bit, it co uh, we call it channel 38, but it actually covers a bit more spectrum than that. It covers, covers TV channel 38. It also covers the space that's in between the 4G transmissions in the old 800 meg band, so a duplex gap which sometimes is referred to as channel 65 because it's roughly where channel 65 used to be when that was TV space. It's not exactly on where channel 65 used to be, but that's what people refer to it as. The problem with 65 is that it's designed to be a guard band between the 4G uplink and downlink. And when there's a lot of 4G activity, they, it bleeds into that space. So your nine megahertz of space, which is what that is, it's a bit more than a TV channel used to be. TV channel is eight, can be reduced to about six or seven megahertz if there's a lot of 4G activity going on. And of course, if what, what, as soon as an event starts, the first thing that people do is start, you know, phones up and streaming stuff to Facebook and what have you. So you could find that at set up time, afternoon, no public in the, in the, in the venue, that that worked perfectly well, but it, it might be a little bit more limited when you've got an audience. So we kind of recommend channel 65 as um, a lifeline for some people who've got legacy equipment to choose to that space, but maybe not necessarily as for new investment in, in new equipment. We do sell channel 65 digital wireless systems and we can pack a reasonable number of channels in. But again, it's for someone who's already using channel 38, already has a channel 38 license 
and then need some extra channels. So, but they they fill channel 30 up with as as many as as they, as they could do. Channel 65 offers an opportunity to add some more channels, maybe. But the the next go-to step, which is also covered by this UK shared license, I keep calling it the channel 38 license because that's what people understand it as, is the 1G8 spectrum. So again, that's another duplex gap between uh, a 4G uplink and downlink. It's the, it's the duplex gap between the EE networks, 4G uplink and downlink. And it's a little bit bigger. Um, but because it's a shorter wavelength, I talked before about the difference in propagation. As you start to move into 1G8, one, one, uh, one you start to lose some range for the same transmitter power. So a 10 milliwatt transmitter in the VHF band will have super long range, you'll have great range. In the UHF band, it's still really, really good, you know, 100 meters plus at 10 milliwatts. When you get up into 1G8, one, one that's gonna to start to reduce a little bit unless you increase the power of the transmitter. So that's, that's the trade-off slightly with moving into the higher frequency. Um, and then above that, not covered by the, the channel 38 license, you've got the deregulated spectrum, which is, um, the old channel 70, um, which was always deregulated, but you're really only going to squeeze two or three systems into, the, into that little bit of channel 70. And again, we, we, we still do make those channel 65 systems do cover 65 and 70, but I would say that if the object of the ex exercise is to have reliable systems with the flexibility to go anywhere in the UK and set up and find spectrum that works, that's not where I would probably put my money. I would stay in the UHF band, or possibly even the VHF band. We make VHF systems as well, you know, so that's probably where I would prob probably stay. You know, when you, you know when you mentioned about in the theatre, that there's a danger unless they use an encrypting of somebody picking it up outside. Wouldn't this Welsh down, they reduce the uh, transmission? Uh, the power, yeah. They could turn down, certainly in, if they turn down the power in the transmitters, it reduces the range. So that then might mean that the signal is too weak to be picked up outside of the building. Um, normally when we talk about squelch in an analog system, it's, it's a receiver squelch that we're talking about. And what that effectively is, is a gate. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a gate that needs a, a, a whole set of rules to be met before it will pass audio through to the sound system. So the first part of Squelch is, is there an RF signal of any description on this channel? You know, otherwise the receiver output is muted. The second part of Squelch is, is the RF signal from a friendly transmitter? So depending on the manufacturer, we will add a component to the transmitter, to the transmission that identifies it as being a sure transmitter and Sennheiser do the same with their systems. So if it was a UHFR system, it's okay. There is some RF there, and there is, um, it is a sure transmitter. That's good. The next part of Squelch looks at the signal-to-noise ratio. So if the noise flow is super high, as that happens, because there's a direct relationship with, 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 in analog systems with the noise flow and the quality of the audio, the noise-based Squelch looks at the quality of the audio. And if it thinks it's not good enough, that Squelch level, it, it, Unless, when the noise creeps above a certain level, again, the, tran the, the output of the receiver stays muted. So there's all these conditions that need to be met before a receiver will send the audio onward to the console. That wouldn't necessarily stop somebody outside from receiving that transmission, you know, with, as I say, just even a, a, an SDR dongle that costs about 30 quid on Amazon, you know, so it's, it's, it's quite easy to do, you know. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll repeat, sorry, yeah, okay. um, so the question was, um, if you've got mi mixing systems, analog and digital, um, is the concern, would you want to, could you overlap analog into the, in, uh, sorry, overlap digital into the analog yeah. space? So we, w whether we're using analog or digital systems or a mix of both, every single channel needs to have its own unique frequency. Depending on the efficiency or the footprint, if you like, of the systems depends on how close we can put those channels together. 
Uh, one of the, the other limiting factors with analog systems is you put two channels on air, you get intermod harmonics, so it starts to generate additional frequencies that, you know, because of the interaction between the two transmitters. So you now will have maybe four frequencies that can't be used because you've got two transmitters on there. And when you put the third one on there, you get more intermods and so on and so forth. And that's one of the really limiting things with the number of channels of analog that you can put on air. Now, if we were just talking about digital systems, digital systems typically don't have intermods, which is why we can put them almost on this equidistant grid. You know, we can just pack them in really close together. If we start putting some analog systems in that mix, Although the digital systems won't create intermods, the analog systems will from the digital transmitters. They will see those digital transmissions and they'll generate harmonics. So it's still a little bit of a limiting factor. And at that point, we would pro I would probably advise that you use something like our wireless workbench software or whatever to do a coordination because it will, in workbench, it has what's known as a hardware profile. So, if, you know, so it knows that the Transmitter power is this, the footprint is this size, the, the p potential for generating harmonics is, is a factor of w whatever, and it calculates all of those parameters. Um, and it will give you a coordination within reason to pro provide you, you're not asking to put you know, 100 transmitters in, in a small space, but it will give you a coordination that will work uh, with both systems. But again, we are generally moving towards a world where analog wireless systems will become less and less, um, you know, less and less useful, to be honest. Yeah. Any more? No? I think that's it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. I hope it was useful. Yeah. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. If you could exit to your right, that's those stairs that way. Yeah. Thank you very it. much. As I said, before, we'll be, uh, we, have got a, we have got a tent outside, so if there was a question that you didn't want to put to the whole world, yeah. come and ask it down there. Happy to talk to you at the stand. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.